Hey guys, welcome back. So for this one, we're jumping into yet another gamer burst issue for what is the prequel to the highly anticipated release of Sony's Spider-Man 2 game, which is dropping this fall. And much like a number of the other comic tie-ins that we covered on the channel, which expand the narrative of the respective game, this one gives us a story that fits in between Spider-Man Miles Morales and Spider-Man 2. And if you're worried about spoilers, I would say that you don't really need to be because this single issue does a great job of just starting and finishing something with just a few beats here and there that'll spill over into the game. And with that said, let's get into it. But first, if you're new to the channel, be sure to subscribe to catch the spills every week. And don't forget to hit that bell up top so we can squat up in the comments for the first hour. All right, so this one begins with Mary J. Watson doing a guest appearance on the J. Jonah Jameson podcast as a bit of a promotion for her new book. But before they can even get into it, Jameson's telling her how he wasn't feeling it and how she needs to jazz it up because her sales haven't been doing that well. But also for MJ who's been traveling and writing, with Peter helping her out by doing the photography, MJ's writing is very real and grounded, with her aiming to just get the truth out. But also for anyone who's listened to J. Jonah Jameson's podcast, Just the Facts with J. Jonah Jameson, you already know that he likes to tell people how to think and imposing his opinions. And even at times where he may have good intentions, he's not necessarily the best at sharing his constructive criticisms in a way where it can be received by whoever he's trying to talk to. And that's precisely where things go left on this podcast. And also MJ's dealing with her own stuff too that we'll get into later. But while the two of them are here and things are getting heated, both Peter and Miles come crashing through the window while fighting the tarantula. And when this happens, it feels like your regular trope on the surface, with the coincidence of both Spider-Men crashing into this podcast. But even that coincidence is addressed throughout the course of this. But when the three of these guys come crashing through the window, Jameson immediately runs for cover while reminding his producers that it's their contractual obligation to become human shields should his life be in danger, which is a pretty wild thing to sneak into a contract. And on the other hand, for MJ, she immediately starts to live stream all of this for the Daily Bugle. But while Peter and Miles are fighting the tarantula, Peter tells this guy, like what, getting smoked by two Spider-Man once wasn't enough? You wanted an encore? To where then tarantula replies, he's trying to get his honor back. But with Peter saying this, for us, this is a callback to Spider-Geddon issue zero which we covered on the channel like three years ago, almost three years. But during Spider-Geddon, which was also an amazing story, this brought 616 Otto Octavius, who at the time was Superior Spider-Man, over to Earth 1048, which is the PlayStation Spider-Man universe, to get that Peter's help, which at the time led to both Otto and Peter teaming up and quote unquote, smoking the tarantula. And if by any chance you missed the video and you wanna go check it out, no worries, I got a link for you just below the like button in case you want a bit more in-depth coverage on how those events unfolded throughout Spider-Geddon. But with the tarantula now going after Peter and Miles, he's essentially trying to get his lick back, of which Miles had nothing to do with in the first place. But at this point, Miles has been Spider-Man long enough to know that with great power comes other people's responsibilities, or whatever it was Uncle Ben said. But with Peter and Miles taking a huge hit from the tarantula, because of Miles going right and not left like he usually does, Miles tells Peter that he learned not to do that, because he almost got killed going left when he fought the Tinkerer, which is a bit of a nod to the events of Spider-Man Miles Morales. But while they're talking, this fight with the tarantula, it gets a very anticlimactic ending. When the tarantula then tries to open fire, but with a combination of performance issues and his gun getting webbed up at the same time, his attack just blows up in his own face. And just like that, both the fight and the interview are over. And later on, Peter even admits that he had steered the fight into that interview as a way of bailing MJ out. But later when Peter and MJ have a conversation, she admits that she wishes her book didn't bomb and it sold a little bit better. And Peter admits that things have been a bit tough for him keeping up with the mortgage after Aunt May had passed because he knew that she had taken out a loan to keep the Feast Center running back when the whole Devil's Breath crisis was going on during the 2018 Spider-Man game. But for Peter, with him knowing that Aunt May took out that loan, he didn't know at the time how much it was for. And with him struggling to keep things together, he doesn't want to lose their place in Forest Hills because that's the last thing that he has left of his Uncle Ben. And with hearing this, MJ asks if Peter's considered getting a housemate. And Peter lets her know that he's thought about it a lot, which is really him implying that MJ moves in. But for MJ, she tells Peter that she needs to stay close to the city for work and that's why she doesn't want to make the move while swearing to Peter that it has nothing to do with them, which then makes the situation a little awkward. But then fortunately, Miles shows up, who in his case, we're told that he has quite a bit on his plate too, with him trying to narrow down and figure out which college 
he wants to go to because he wants to go to a great music school with the strong math department. So Peter and MJ give him a bit of advice with Peter telling Miles that the choice is important and to make sure that he follows his heart because his decision, his studies, his student loans, those will follow him for the rest of his life. And on the other hand, MJ tells Miles that he could always go somewhere and switch his major if it doesn't feel right. But from here, Miles suggests that they do a bit of the spider talk to take his mind off of school and he tells them that he had done an adjustment to Peter's lures, which are the pinging ones, like what Peter had given to MJ back when we had to play as her, which is an experience that I hope to never go through again. So from here, Miles tells them that they can come along to the computer store so that he can get some parts unless they want to stay here and have some couples time. So the two of them, they just end up going because it was either that or back to being awkward. But after the computer store, they stop by Lux Car Repair with something inside setting off Peter's spider sense. And soon after, with MJ realizing that someone had broken in and disabled the alarm, Peter and Miles suit up and they take a closer look inside. And what they end up finding is a group of guys in some red hoods who aren't exactly car thieves or at least not good ones. But nonetheless, with these guys being up to no good, Peter and Miles jump in and go after them. And rather quickly, they start to make threats magical threats while saying that they work for the hood and he has the forces of darkness at his command which right away that kind of talk has peter thinking that these guys are larpers and perhaps they're part of some live action role playing group that went rogue but then when peter kicks one of these guys and he disappears for a moment it has him thinking well maybe these guys are magic but then when mj steps in she throws this bucket full of some type of chemical on one of the guys who swears that it's toxic but doing this allows peter to see where this guy is as miles webs up the others because with the hood men invisible, Peter and Miles can't sense them using their spider senses until they attack. But from here, they're able to take down the rest of these guys. And for a moment, Peter even uses his electric webbing, which is one of those skills that I hope we have at the beginning of the game. Cause you know how sometimes sequels will make you start over, like your character just forgot everything that happened in the first game. But either way, it isn't long before Peter notices that him and Miles had set off an alarm that would have the police showing up any minute. So he tells Miles that it'll probably be better if the two of them meet the police in their civilian clothing rather than as two Spider-Men at the scene of the crime. But while these cops are here, MJ tells Officer Lopez that she's with the Daily Bugle and she asks them if they got any information on these perpetrators. And he tells her that they've had reports recently that match the description. But between these two officers, they then discuss how the inside of the building is now empty and regardless of them having the place around it and no doors open, these guys still found a way out. And one of them says that it must have been magic. But Peter and Miles both know that those guys inside were unconscious. And the two of them have their suspicions about these guys using any magic. Even though Peter admits that he's seen things similar to magic, whether it's been Mr. Negative's shadow demons or a guy who turns into sand. But then it's here where MJ chimes in and she lets them know that she's looked into what Officer Lopez mentioned about the similar reports that have been happening lately. And as it turns out, this same hooded crew has been after high end cars, cash, electronics, and pretty much anything they can get their hands on. So she sends them the known locations so they can focus on that area and perhaps get lucky. But even still, Peter admits that this is a bit weird because if these guys do actually have some type of stealthing tech or powers, and for the sake of the argument, even magic, why would these guys only be pulling smash and grabs? Like something's off here. But while Peter and Miles are heading out to the known locations area, Miles gets a tip on his friendly neighborhood Spider-Man app about some weird activity at a jewelry store nearby. So the two of them go to check it out and MJ lets them know that she's on her way. But this time around, since they know what they're getting into, as soon as they go inside, Peter just goes off with the web blossom, which is another one of his suit powers, getting some shine. But with doing this and putting webs everywhere, they catch a few of the Hood's crew here. And right away, Miles pulls one of these guys' hoods off and it just confirms their theory that these guys aren't as magical as they seem. But while they're here, it isn't long before Miles realizes that the tech that these guys are using was originally designed by Finn Mason the tinkerer and with her undoubtedly being no longer with us miles assumes that the hood may have just found one of her caches around town and just repurposed her tech but with the hood's men not being so willing to share information when mj gets here she pulls up pictures that peter had sent her of all these guys unmasked so with her now knowing who they are she starts reading out their real names and insinuating that she's just gonna put their information out there which for these guys because of their shady history that's pretty much a death sentence so one of these guys just starts singing and he tells them that they don't know the hood's real name they weren't dumb enough to ask and the hood led them to the tinkerer's stash which is where they got the tech but this guy is truly convinced that the hood is magic because 
because not only did the hood turn invisible, but he also walked on air. But this is something that Miles immediately remembers, Finn's tech being able to do, because she made boots for her men out of programmable matter, allowing them to jump and climb, so it's not far off that those boots could have been modified. But then eventually they get this other guy to talk, and he tells them that the hood needs money so that he can pay for some magic artifact to get smuggled here from overseas, which has the power of life and death. And so of course, with hearing this, it's a pretty wild story. But as they get ready to ask these guys a few more questions, the lights go out, and while they're out, shots just start going off, and one of these dudes who's webbed up on the ground just starts screaming, the hood's here to send you to hell. So MJ tries to hit the fire alarm to set off the sprinklers, but there's just way too many shots incoming. So Peter goes for it, but then he's hit, and he misses. So the next, Miles goes for the 360 web blast, but when he says this, two floating guns tell him that it's not good to telegraph what you're doing like an idiot. But of course, it's the hood, and with him telling this to Miles, he was telegraphing what he was doing, like an idiot. But as soon as Miles kicks the hood down, his men go after him and Peter, and during the mix-up, the hood gets away, along with the most expensive jewelry in the store, which from there leaves them with no leads and a cold trail. Because the hood's gone, and the jewelry he took, it's enough for him to get that magic artifact that he needed. But at least with running into the hood for the first time, they know that they're dealing with tech and not magic. They know that the modified tech that he's using to cloak himself is vulnerable to sonic attacks. So Miles continues to modify the lures, making it into a new device that they'll use later. And I'm sure those sonics will also work well for somebody else down the line. But for the time being, the closest shot they have at catching the hood is a list of smugglers that MJ's put together who have deals that are going down tonight. So from there, Peter and Miles split the list and they meet up later that evening. And they end up taking their chances on Earth 1048's version of the foreigner, whose name kept coming up. And as it turns out, he also imports art and historical relics and he's the most active smuggler in the area, so why not? And from here, Peter and Miles end up making their way to the pier. But by the time they get there, they see the smuggler's boat leaving, which means by now the deal has already taken place. So it's here where Miles uses the sonic device by adjusting it to the frequency that disrupted the hood's cloaking before. So from here, they just end up sweeping the area so that when they get close enough, they'll actually be able to see the hood. And with how Miles designed it, it plays his beats and it carries the frequency through the beats, which kind of have like, okay, thought we was trying to follow somebody but as it turns out it works and they end up finding the hood and they're not really sure if he saw them seeing him but nonetheless they get ready to sneak into this building to see if they can get the drop on him but as they head in peter tells miles to be ready for anything because it could be an army of guys inside they could have guns bombs it could be ja morant on a live stream you never know but as they made their way in what they ended up seeing was not what they expected which was the hood pouring his heart out to his mother because everything he had done was so that he could afford the lifeline tablet which he believes will save his mother's life but really quickly the lifeline tablet which in some cases is also referred to as the tablet of life and time has made a number of appearances in the amazing spider-man volume 1 issue 68 through 75 as well as spider-man lifeline and even marvel zombies and regardless of whatever earth designation it may appear in it's said to be able to do pretty much the same thing cure any sickness raise the dead you know plot device type stuff but for the hood with him telling his mother that he's going to use this to cure her to save her she tells tells him not to because she's at peace with her condition and she's ready to go but he goes on to say the spell anyway and when he starts miles begins to tell peter like you know let's get in there more or less we got him let's end this but peter stops miles because he wants to see how this plays out and when the hood goes on to do this spell something magical starts to happen and when it stops he asks his mom if the cancer has gone but she tells him no nothing's changed which immediately sends him into frustration. But at this point, Peter's like, that's enough, it's over. But before Parker Robbins, the hood, gives up, he tells both Spider-Man that he'll make a deal with them and he'll let them have the tablet when he's done. And he goes on to ask them, isn't there someone you wish you could heal? Someone who's passed? that you'd give anything to bring back. And right away, the two of them hesitate, with Miles thinking of his dad, Jefferson Davis, and Peter thinking of Aunt May Parker. But Peter tells him he's sorry, and they'll make sure that his mother gets the best possible care. But it's time for Parker Davis Robbins to face reality. And it is kind of crazy how Parker Davis Robbins has Miles' dad's name and Aunt May's name in his name. But I mean, the hood doesn't know that. And he's really not trying to take no for an answer. 
so he starts letting off shots and telling both the Spider-Man that it's their fault that the spell didn't work. And he even goes to the point of desperation and saying that their blood sacrifice might do the trick, which may have been trash talk, but I think he meant it. But eventually his mother calls out to him. She screams for him to stop and she tells him that she doesn't have much time left, but the little time that she does have, she wants to spend it with her son. And she's always told him this, but he's never listened. And she asked him to at least give her that in this last moment of her life. And with hearing this, Parker Robbins, he asked if he can have a moment with his mother to where Peter and Miles give him a moment. But even with Parker Robbins taking the time to stop what he's doing and spend it with his mother, he apologizes. She tells him it's okay. But just seconds later, she passes. And it's a real heavy moment for the guy. But for Miles and Peter, with them knowing what he's going through, they give Parker time to mourn. And to take it a step further, they go outside and they tell the police to give him a moment too. And for the police, understandably, they're a bit skeptical. But Peter reminds Officer Hayden how he pulled him out of a burning car. And Miles reminds Officer Donahue how he saved him from the rhino. So they use their personal favors to kind of buy Parker Robbins some time. But I do also want to mention that the hood of Earth 616, his story is very similar. But in his case, he looked up to criminals like Electro, but this one shot a demon, took his cloak and its boots, and they were actually magical. And also he could walk on air. So it's a nice bit of a twist that we got for the hood of Earth 1048. But as we go back, the officers end up agreeing with both Spider-Man. And not even minutes later, Parker comes outside with his hands up and he lets the police take him away because now his mother's gone and he says there's nothing left to fight for. And from here, when we go over to the next day, we more or less coast into the conclusion of all this with Peter and MJ sorting out their differences and Peter admitting that this whole time he's been worried about MJ and her safety with all that they've been through and MJ's been bugging because her book didn't do well. But also at this point, Miles has chosen a school, he's going to ESU, so he asked Peter to give him a recommendation. And I gotta say, with how this issue is ending, it kind of feels like the ending of a movie you'd see on BET, you know, and I'm hopeful, or however that song go. And as the music's playing, it shows a picture of each person and what they doing for the next 10, 20 years is i mean i'm just getting that kind of vibe from it but as we follow mj she makes her way back to the daily bugle where come to find out in the conference room j jonah jameson is buying back the daily bugle and he's coming back to run it and when he's asked why or what prompted this he says it's because he wants to teach the younger generation the benefit of his wisdom and experience and also what it means to practice journalism the j jonah jameson way which is pretty cool to see. But I can't help but wonder if this is some kind of setup for Eddie Brock to make his way to the Bugle. Well, I guess we'll find out in Spider-Man 2. And so now real quick, I wanna give a special shout out to all the patrons. Thank you guys for all of your support. And for anyone who's new here who wants more information on how to support the channel, I got a link below where you can go to patreon.com slash dope spill. But that'll do it for this one guys, and let me know in the comments below if y'all want to go back and cover City at War, which is pretty much the 2018 Spider-Man game, but I think it would be fun. Anyway, let me know what you guys think, and we'll do it again on the next one. Alright, later.